And one of the great things about science is that truth always wins. And that makes it different from many other subjects where it's about history and economics and philosophy. Uh, people can argue for generations. And uh, this is one of the things which is least understood by the public and the media, because the media always think that, as say in, in, in politics, they have to bring together two opposing views. But in, in, in science, there are not two opposing views. Nature always tells you what's right, and that, and that is final. Uh, father was a textile man. He owned a textile printing mill, which originally had been part of the Austrian Empire, but was now in Czechoslovakia. And it was taken for granted that this is, was my, my, my future. Um, however, I don't know when I changed my mind, but uh, when I was 18, my last year at school, I had an English girlfriend and she went back to England in the summer, but uh, we had become close friends and we exchanged letters and fortunately she kept all my letters and returned them to me recently. And there I found in August uh, 1932 I wrote to her, I'm turning over and over in my mind how I could get out of becoming a textile manufacturer in a Czech village and um, having to give up chemistry. Surely it, mankind would suffer an incalculable loss if I uh, failed to win the Nobel Prize. Well, uh, we, we wrote to each other tongue in cheek. I mean, it seriously it never occurred to me that this might actually come true. But I was very amused to find myself writing this age 19. We are not Jews by religion anymore, but I mean, that would have not, not have made the slightest difference. Uh, they, they, they would have been taken to Auschwitz and killed for being of the Jewish race. I managed to guarantee my parents' support to the Home Office and to get them a visa to enter the country. So they arrived here in March 1939 and remained here for the remainder of their lives. Neither of my parents or any of the relations had ever had any connection to science or knew anything about science. And in a way this was sad because this did open a gulf between us, especially later when they came to Cambridge and, you know, they couldn't really understand what I was doing and why I was doing it. My father's reaction to my success, my father was always distressed that I earned so little money, that I had such a small salary. Now one day I rang him up and told him that I've just heard that I've been elected a fellow of the Royal Society, to which he replied, but they don't pay you anything for this. One of the most important things for the morale of the lab is the head of the lab is, is interested in everybody's work. See, if, if, if there's a feeling that he isn't interested, well, then, then you know, well, who, who is? So this, this is an essential part of, of, of creating a good atmosphere. And there again, you see, being in the canteen or a tea, you know, I, I was able to talk to everybody and ask them what they were doing. You can have a boss who who um, takes an interest 
in the structure and, and is thinking about it all the time. And you can have a boss who's constantly coming around and saying, how's it going? What's Max, Max was not like the second one. He's like the first one. That he's and so when he was there when he was needed, and I could see that he was influencing the people who were my bosses. Um, well, I think people were, were drawn to the LMB like, like, a, like bees to a honeypot. It, it, was, it was the place to be if you were interested in molecular biology, the place in the world to be, because molecular biology in the 60s and 70s was, was a, a new, new subject. It was clearly a, um, a, a hothouse, I suppose, a place where exciting things were happening and exciting things could happen. I remember a group of us talking in my first year or so, postdocs of Sydney, all working on the worm, and saying to each other that, um, by golly, you know, it was our fault if we didn't manage to make something of all this. We had all the facilities and all the encouragement we could want. And so it was very exciting. The, the immediate region where I was working, which was in fairly close association with Fred, was really zinging. And we worked incredibly hard, but we had a wonderful esprit de corps, and you really had the feeling that you were really working at the frontier of what was going on, as indeed we were. Well, I thought the most important thing was to organize it so that <coughs> they, they collaborate and talk to each other and to, uh, do not sit locked away in separate rooms. And that there's a, an openness about the lab, that no secrets. Everybody talks, should be able to talk to everybody else. And, um, well, um, I think the canteen helped a great deal. Sorry? Yes, I planned the canteen, but, but Gisela uh, founded it and organized it and worked there every day. There were instructions that nobody should be turned out because the place has to be cleared up there, that people could sit there as long as they liked. And because it, this was the place where, where people talked about their work. Somehow, Max had engendered this, this atmosphere, a kind of family atmosphere, where everybody evidently cared and was interested in each other, and, and also young people were not to feel inhibited about going and talking to their elders and betters. And in, indeed, this, the, they, welcomed, they welcomed this. And so, um, the, the, of course, the, the, the coffee room, the tea room at the, the LMB is, is famous throughout the world. <laughs> One of the problems in certain labs is that the, the professor won't tolerate anybody who is cleverer than he. And um, that, that I liked to have people around who were cleverer than I. Someone internal is going to take it over. Because I learned something from them usually and, and uh, they, they produced interesting ideas and they were great fun to talk to and sort of sometimes would help me to understand my own problem better. That was something that, that I, I learned fairly quickly, is, is that these were people who were really not frightened to work on, on big problems, and you know, they, they weren't intimidated by working on problems that might take many years to solve. We were amazed and rather appalled at the questions that Max would ask at the ends of seminars because he would ask something apparently completely naive and we'd say to ourselves, we know the answer to that. Why is he asking that question? Is he stupid or something? <laughs> and I didn't understand why he was doing it. I often ask naive questions because I sort of try and put myself into the frame of the man, mind of the people who are not familiar, all right, they're, they're, they're scientists, but they're not familiar with that specialty, and ask myself, now, would they understand this? And usually the people who don't know about it are ashamed that they don't know, so they don't dare to ask. But um, I thought, I don't need to be ashamed, so I just ask. Uh, whenever you ask nature a question, it gives you an answer which is much more subtle and marvelous than anything you could ever think up. And that gives you a kind of humility. You have to 
look, look at nature and ask, what's it trying to tell you? Without deciding beforehand, There was just one method, a physical method, X-ray crystallography, which offered any hope of solving the problem, but even that was doubtful, because everybody thought it would never solve the structure of this complex molecule as this. And I thought an, an enormous amount of effort, and years of effort, would be worthwhile to solve this problem, and I had my mind fixed on, on this of finding a way, you see, finding a way of solving it. I used to carry on with my X-ray pictures day and night, you see, and I would set my alarm and every two hours I would get up and turn my crystal by another three degrees and restart the X-ray tube, take another photograph and so on. The other research students in the lab thought I was crazy to take this on. But then, you see, I reflected that it, hemoglobin may be a thousand times more complex than the structures they were working on, but it was also a thousand times more interesting. Now, you notice two things. The spots are arranged very nicely and regularly, and that merely gives you the distance between the hemoglobin molecules and the crystal. But then you see that the spots have different degrees of blackness. Some are very dark and others are quite faint. And uh, that we call the intensities of the spots. The problem is that uh, measuring the intensities gives you only half the information needed to solve the structure of the crystal. The other half is called the phase. They give beautiful X-ray diffraction pictures. So those thrilled me enormously, you know, and I would show them to all my friends, say, but look what marvelous X-ray pictures I got from these hemoglobin crystals. And when, but when they asked me what they meant, they would change the subject because I had no idea. You know, having put this tremendous effort into the work, I think I just couldn't face saying it was all in vain. It, it to told me nothing. It, it's just more than you are capable of it to admit to yourself that this was useless. You, you, had, you had to throw it, throw it all, all away. And of, of course, as you, you can imagine, I, I, was, I was very unhappy indeed, because I didn't really know what to do next, and how to, f to find the true solution. And I noticed that the attaching two mercury atoms to two sulfur atoms in hemoglobin still uh, kept the physiological properties of hemoglobin intact. It's still combined with oxygen. So, you know, then uh, the, the penny dropped and I realized if I did this, uh, perhaps uh, I would get an effect. Well, imagine sailing for years through uncharted water, and then suddenly you see land rising on the horizon. And this model emerging was like this. So one morning in September 1959, 
Our results came out of the computer at the Cambridge University Mathematics Laboratory, thousands of numbers, which we plotted on sheets of paper, and then we drew contours around them, and there emerged a landscape of peaks and valleys. So I built this model, and um, suddenly saw this thing, you know, which I had been working on for 22 years, and it was a fantastically exciting moment. I always say it was like reaching the top of a mountain after a very hard climb and falling in love at the same time. And really an in, in intensity of joy and jubilation and admiration, which perhaps only you find only in, in science when nature reveals one of its, its great secrets. So that was marvelous. Then I saw there were four peaks which were bigger than all the others and I realized that these must be the four atoms of iron which are in the hemoglobin molecule and they are attached to a dye called porphyrin and it's the iron plus the porphyrin which forms the heme, the dye that makes, makes the blood red. But later it was found actually that hemoglobins occur not only in vertebrates but also in insects, all sorts of other species, even in bacteria. And the remarkable thing is that the fold of the chain is the same in all of these. So, you know, once evolution, as it were, had developed this, it used it over and over again in different animals uh, just to, to deliver oxygen. It soon got around and it was, got this model and lots of people, friends, colleagues came along to see this sort of its uh, wonder of the world. And I wrote up the work for publication in, in Nature and went off on a skiing holiday at Christmas. And I was surprised when I came back because I realized suddenly I'd become famous. And this is the iron atom, which combines with oxygen. There's an oxygen molecule on the same scale, and it would be sitting here. And now the question is, why does the combination with oxygen uh, set off the change of structure of the hemoglobin molecule? And what our maps show was that in the hemoglobin with oxygen, the iron is in the plane of the ring like this. Uh, without oxygen, it moves. I mean, the displacement is minute if you sort of think of our macroscopic world at 200 millionths of a centimeter. But you see, in the atomic world, this is a large displacement. And when the iron moves, it also moves the amino acid to which it is linked, which you see here. So this would be moving in and out, and this clearly seemed to be the trigger that set off, off the change in structure. The movement that the displacement of the iron atoms triggers is a rotation of one half of the molecule relative to the other half. Now, you see, the amazing thing about this molecule is that this huge edifice, which contains 10,000 atoms, 10,000 atoms of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen and sulfur, exists for the sole purpose of taking up four molecules of oxygen in the lungs 
and delivering them to the tissues so that they can be used to burn the food we eat and give us energy. An incredible thing for all this to come out in the space of a week. You see, just following Bragg's advice, look, look at the model and see what it's trying to tell you, and it did. At his first cabinet meeting, uh, Churchill decided that all uh, German and Austrians, all any millennials of military age, living within so many miles of the coast should be interned. And as a result, one beautiful sunny Sunday morning in May, a policeman appeared at our house to arrest me. I was desperately unhappy because having been rejected by my own country as a Jew, and I found myself rejected by my adopted country as an enemy. I sort of brooded how I might escape from the camp and jump on a goods train in the middle of the night and uh, travel towards the American border and fight myself through the forests and then there join my brother and sister on the other side. But then I looked at the towers manned by soldiers with machine guns surrounding us and my heart sank again. To keep up our morale, I organized a camp university in Quebec and I tried to find lecturers among all the bright students there. So uh, one of them was Hermann Bondi, now Sir Hermann and formerly chief scientific advisor to the Ministry of Defense and master of Churchill College. Well, he was a mathematics undergraduate here at Cambridge, and he gave a course of in, in vector analysis. Did I want to stay and wait for me to go to the United States, or did I want to, want to return to England? So without the slightest hesitation, I said I wanted to return to England because that was where my, where my parents were and my work and, and a girlfriend. So, to which he remarked that I would make a fine soldier, which nobody has said to me before or afterwards. I don't think I've ever been as desperate in my life as sitting in that camp week after week. I couldn't do any work anymore because, you see, the, the, all this crowd of several hundred people, we were all in one room, and the noise and chat that one got, went on all around it made it impossible to solve uh, examples in, in, in differential calculus. So finally we, we landed at Liverpool and I was released and given a train ticket to London. And when I <coughs> came to Cambridge, the two of the laboratory technicians waited me for me at the station and again sort of <coughs> my friend my voice is breaking, is it? I tell the story that <coughs> they welcomed me as, as old friends and told me that my parents were alive and well at Cambridge. So this was a, a great relief. Look for an important problem 
and don't be deterred if it turns out to be difficult because the important ones always are difficult. And young people now are under, are under great pressure to produce publica publications, to produce results. So uh, they are really pushed to uh, take on only problems which are safe, which you can answer within the time of a grant of, of three years. And um, I think that's a sad thing. You sh shouldn't worry too much how long it might take and uh, whether it will be possible to solve the problem. Just as in, in other works of, as walks of life, in science, if you want to win, you have to take risks. One of the most important things for the morale of the lab is the head of the lab is, is interested in everybody's work. See, so if, if, if there's a feeling that he isn't interested, well, then, then you know, well, who, who is? So this, this is an essential part of, of, of creating a good atmosphere. And there again, you see, being in the canteen or a tea, you know, I, I was able to talk to everybody and ask them what they were doing. You can have a boss who who um, takes an interest in the structure and, and is thinking about it all the time. And you can have a boss who's constantly coming around and saying, how's it going? What's, Max, Max was not like the second one. He's like the first one. That he's, and so when he was there when he was needed, and I could see that he was influencing the people who were my bosses. Um, well, I think people were, were drawn to the LMB like, like, a, like bees to a honeypot. It, it, was, it was the place to be if you were interested in molecular biology, the place in the world to be, because molecular biology in the 60s and 70s was, was a, a new new subject. There's a, an openness about the lab, that no secrets. Everybody talks, should be able to talk to everybody else. And, um, well, um, I think the canteen helped a great deal. I planned the canteen, but, but Gisela uh, founded it and organized it and worked there every day. There were instructions that nobody should be turned out because the place has to be cleared up there, that people could sit there as long as they liked. And because this was the place where, where people talked about their work. Somehow Max had engendered this, this atmosphere, a kind of family atmosphere where Everybody evidently cared and was interested in each other, and, and also young people were not to feel inhibited about going and talking to their elders and betters. We were amazed and rather appalled at the questions that Max would ask at the ends of seminars, because he would ask something apparently completely naive, and we'd say to ourselves, we know the answer to that. Why is he asking that question? Is he stupid or something? <laughs> and I didn't understand why he was doing it. So to try and put myself into the frame of the man, mind of the people who are not familiar, or right, they're, they're, they're scientists, but they're not familiar with that specialty, and ask myself, now, would they understand this? And usually the people who don't know about it are ashamed that they don't know, so they don't dare to ask. But um, I thought, I don't need to be ashamed, so I just ask. When, when I got here, there, there was this crucial problem. I realized that uh, without understanding the structure of proteins, we would never understand how, how life works. So this, this, it seemed to me, it was the key problem of biology. At that time, uh, everybody thought the genes are also made of protein. So uh, proteins were the thing, and um, there was just one method, a physical method, X-ray crystallography, which offered any hope of solving the problem, but even that was doubtful, because everybody thought it would never solve the structure as complex a molecule as this. And I thought an 
an enormous amount of effort and years of effort would be worthwhile to solve this problem. And I had my mind fixed on, on this, of finding a way, you see, finding a way of solving it. I came to this uh, crystallographic uh, section of the Cavendish Laboratory to work with Bernal, hoping on a crystal of biological interest. But when I got here, Bernal didn't have any such crystals. He uh, gave me some uh, mineral fragments picked up from a slag heap given to him by the professor of mineralogy who wanted to know what sort of structure they had. So they, they were horrible, horrible things to, to work with, but they did teach me some crystallography. Well, as a result, I didn't really have a proper subject for my thesis by the end of my first year, and I returned to Austria for the summer holidays, uh, rock climbing as usual, and but then it, it started raining and rained and rained and rained and I started thinking about my thesis. thesis. When I remembered that um, a cousin of mine in Prague had married a, chem a biochemist, a professor of biochemistry at Charles University. So I took the train to Prague and um, talked to him about what I might do. And what I suggested to him that I might do the crystallographic structure of heme, you know, the, the, the molecule that the dye in hemoglobin. But he said that it wasn't really interesting because it had already been synthesized. Why don't I take on hemoglobin? But I didn't know how to. And he pointed out to me that there was a physiologist in Cambridge who had crystallized it, Gilbert Adair. So I returned to Cambridge. But, um, you know, in those days you couldn't just walk into somebody's lab and say, give me some crystals. You had to be introduced. And fortunately, uh, Hopkins' daughter gave a lunch party to which she invited Adair and myself, and there we were formally introduced. So I could ask him politely to let me have some hemoglobin crystals. So he, he arrived one morning with some uh, crystals of hemoglobin saying, you know, I don't know whether these will be good enough, sort of, he was, was a very uh, modest and shy man, and I looked at them and they were marvelous. And the first X-ray diffraction picture I took of them was great, so that set me off. Uh, now, let me explain. When I came here, I came to work with uh, John Desmond Bernal, a crystallographer, a remarkable man, the most interesting talker I've ever met in my life, a most inspiring teacher. It was really great fun to work with him. And at that time, when I started, it seemed so little was known about the structure of protein that anything I could find out about it, even though, I, if I, even though it may not be possible to solve the structure completely, would be of great interest. And so it was. Late in later years, he would drop into the lab and ask what I was doing and however badly things were going, just his, his presence would give me heart and fill me with enthusiasm again. So he was that kind of inspiring character. In October 1937, the Cavendish professor of physics, of which the crystallography was part, died. And Bragg was appointed as successor to Rutherford in Cambridge. Now, Bragg had been the founder of X-ray crystallography. And um, I was hoping he would come round the lab and see what we were all doing and see that I was there taking my X-ray photographs of hemoglobin. But um, when he didn't come, I plucked up my courage and went to see him in the Rutherford's Victorian office in the old Cavendish uh, with my X-ray pictures under my arm. 
Now, when I showed him this, he was immediately taken with the idea that the method of X-ray analysis, of determining the structure of molecules by X-ray diffraction, that this might be extended to the molecules of the living cell. And uh, when I told him that I would have to stop because I had no money, he promised to help me. Uh, it was a fundamental pro physical problem. Uh, may I show you an X-ray diffraction picture, which you see here? So here you see a film which has several hundred little spots on it. And each spot is a diffracted image of the hemoglobin crystal. Now, you notice two things. The spots are arranged very nicely and regularly. And that merely gives you the distance between the hemoglobin molecules and the crystal. But then you see that the spots have different degrees of blackness. Some are very dark and others are quite faint. And uh, that we call the intensities of the spots. The problem is that uh, measuring the intensities gives you only half the information needed to solve the structure of the crystal. The other half is called the phase. And now let me explain what this is. Supposing you imagine yourself reduced to atomic scale and you fix your eye on one particular atom. Now an X-ray comes in and the atom scatters X-rays. In fact, it's the electrons, not the nucleus. The electrons in the atom scatter X-rays. Now, uh, the, and then the scattering from different atoms combines and finally produces that black spot. But the question now is, uh, did the wave that was, is contributed by all these atoms, did that wave have a crest at that atom? Or did it have a trough? Or did it have some intermediate value? And this is the information you need to solve the structure. So for each of these sp spots you, you have here, you actually have to find the exact value of the, uh, of the wave, whether a crest or a trough or some intermediate value, at that particular atom. So say now, uh, this is only a small part of the diffraction pattern. In fact, we must visualize it as a sphere drawn all around this, containing several thousands of these spots. And each spot is associated with it an intensity, a blackness, and the phase, which means the uh, position of the wave with regard to that one reference atom. And uh, when X-ray crystallography started, there was no way of measuring this. For some quite different purpose, I decided to measure the fraction of the incident X-ray that is diffracted by my hemoglobin crystal. And I found that fraction much weaker than I had expected. And I realized then that uh, the uh, 99% of the scattering contributions from these thousands of atoms are extinguished by interference, and that only a small fraction of the that scattering actually emerges from the crystal as a diffracted ray. And so it then occurred to me that in a heavy atom, all the electrons would be concentrated almost at the point and they would all scatter in unison. So they would make a strong contribution. And uh, that uh, might be of the same order as the contributions of all these light atoms, which also reduced so much interference. So, you know, then uh, the, the penny dropped, and I realized if I did this, uh, perhaps, I would get an effect. And uh, Vernon Ingram, the biochemist that joined us, helped me to attach two mercury atoms to the 
sulfur atoms in hemoglobin and the, we crystallized it and I took the first x-ray picture and then there was this dramatic moment when I compared the picture with and without the heavy atom and uh, saw that there were just these small differences in the relative intensities of the spots which I had expected and which would make it possible to work out first of all the positions of the heavy atom and then having found that to calculate the phases. So well, there was this dramatic moment when, when Bragg and I looked at these x-ray pictures <laughs> which I had just developed and saw the subtle differences that uh, we had expected. Each of these peaks here gives the, the degree of blackness of a spot. And so this is a weak one and that's a strong one and that's a very weak one and so on. And here is the trace of the same row of spots uh, without and with the heavy atom. Now if you start here, you see here it's strong, weak, strong. And there, the same row, you see, it's strong, medium, medium. So you see how this spot, these two spots have changed and this will continue. You see that this spot has got much weaker and that one has got stronger, that one has got weaker and so on. And from these differences it was possible to calculate the positions of the heavy atoms and once I had found those to uh, calculate phases. And well, what to do, the next thing to do was to find a way of introducing a, another heavy atom. But this proved exceedingly difficult and it, it several year, years of frustration followed again. There was one uh, American postdoc, Howard Dintzis, who was uh, also a very good chemist and specialized in synthesis of heavy atom compounds, and he helped John Kendrew to introduce heavy atoms into myoglobin, which worked and enabled him to solve that structure in three dimensions. But none of his attempts to introduce this in hemoglobin worked. So then he left and he went back to America. But after he left, I discovered that he had a whole cupboard full of hemoglobin crystals with various heavy atoms, which he had never looked at. Well, I, I went through that lot and took x-ray pictures of the various crystals. And sure enough, I found one preparation which uh, showed different intensity changes from those I've just shown you here. So clearly had a heavy atom in a different position. And there it was that solved the problem. You see, so I, I said afterwards, it's marvelous if all these American postdocs come, but it also sometimes helps if they leave again. <laughs> that took hundreds of X-ray diffraction pictures recording this three-dimensional diffraction pattern layer by layer in uh, not just two actually, in the end six different heavy atom compounds because I was terribly anxious that the phases should be accurate and to make them accurate it would, I realized it was a great help to have not just two but several different heavy atom derivatives. And that, that was just terribly hard work, you know. And finally, all this information was put into the new EDSAC tool, the Cambridge University computer, until uh, one fine morning in September 1959. These tapes came out with hundreds of numbers representing the distribution of electron density through the hemoglobin molecule. And these were then plotted on perspex sheets and contoured and uh, I could start building the model which you've seen.
and this is the ion atom, which combines with oxygen. There's an oxygen molecule on the same scale, and it would be sitting here. And now the question is, why does the combination with oxygen uh, set off the change of structure of the hemoglobin molecule? And what our maps show was that in the hemoglobin with oxygen, the ion is in the plane of the ring like this. Uh, without oxygen, it moves. I mean, the displacement is minute if you sort of think of our macroscopic world at 200 millionths of a centimeter. But you see in the atomic mo world, this is a large displacement. And when the ion moves, it also moves the amino acid to which it is linked, which you see here. So this would be moving in and out, and this clearly seemed to be the trigger that set off, off the change in structure. The movement that the displacement of the ion atoms triggers is a rotation of one half of the molecule relative to the other half. And they move in unison relative to the other half of the molecule that turn by 15 degrees. Now, you see, the amazing thing about this molecule is that this huge edifice which contains 10,000 atoms, 10,000 atoms of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen and sulfur, exists for the sole purpose of taking up four molecules of oxygen in the lungs and delivering them to the tissues so that they can be used to burn the food we eat and give us energy.